If you want a complete and concise explanation to hypokalemia, then you've come to the right place. Because in today's video, we're going to explain potassium regulation and hypokalemia from a physiologic perspective. We'll go through the causes, symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment of this electrolyte abnormality. And if you're a nursing student, I'll give you some specific nursing considerations. So put on your thinking cap and let's get started. Body fluids are divided between the intracellular and the extracellular fluid compartments. The extracellular space is high in things like sodium and chloride, and the intracellular space is high in things like potassium, and it has a moderate amount of magnesium in it. 98% of body potassium is found in the intracellular space, which leaves only about 2% in the extracellular fluid. So if we take the word hypokalemia and we break it down, hypo means low, cal is the prefix for potassium, and emia means blood. So therefore, hypokalemia is a low blood potassium level. Normal blood potassium is a range between 3.5 and 5 milliequivalents per liter. So therefore, hypokalemia is a blood potassium level of less than 3.5. So potassium is needed to maintain the resting membrane potential of nerve and muscle cells, and it also plays a big role in acid-base balance. On a cellular level, there are two specific pumps that regulate potassium, and these are the sodium potassium ATPase and the hydrogen potassium ATPase. The sodium potassium pump transfers three sodium ions out of the cell for every two potassium ions that it transfers into the cell. And this pump can be found in the kidneys and in normal cells. The hydrogen potassium pump moves potassium and hydrogen in opposite directions. And whereas the sodium potassium pump always had to move potassium into the cell, the hydrogen potassium pump can move potassium either into the cell or out of the cell but whichever way potassium is moving, hydrogen must go in the opposite direction. But on a macro level, potassium is excreted through the kidneys and the kidneys excrete 90% of potassium through the GI tract and through the sweat. So the causes of hypokalemia can be broken down into a decreased intake of potassium an increased loss of potassium, and a shift of potassium from the extracellular to the intracellular space. Inadequate intake of potassium is pretty rare. It occurs more commonly in elderly patients because of poor eating habits. Maybe they have poorly fitting dentures, or maybe they're depressed or isolated and aren't eating. If it occurs in young people, it's usually the result of malnutrition, anorexia, or bulimia. Potassium losses can be grouped into GI losses, skin losses, and renal losses. So the gastrointestinal tract actually houses a lot of potassium. So any kind of loss of gastric fluids will therefore cause a loss of potassium. And in practice, this includes things like vomiting, diarrhea, and nasogastric suctioning. So anytime you have a patient with an NG tube hooked up to intermittent suctioning, you'll want to monitor their potassium levels. And don't be surprised if you have a patient who comes in for nausea and vomiting and they have a low potassium level. Vomiting will cause a loss of gastric fluids and thus of potassium. Moving on to skin losses. So part of the role of the integumentary system is to maintain fluid balance. Anytime the skin barrier is disrupted, we lose fluids and electrolytes. So if we have severe burns, we lose potassium and become hypokalemic. As far as renal losses go, thiazide and loop diuretics are the most common culprit. Diuretics block the reabsorption of sodium in the kidneys. 
And if we have a decreased serum sodium level, the body triggers the release of aldosterone. And aldosterone will reabsorb sodium through the sodium potassium ATPase. And because it uses this pump, it has to secrete potassium into the filtrate. So aldosterone will reabsorb sodium, but excrete potassium. And then we will get a hypokalemia. The last cause we need to talk about are the factors that cause potassium to move from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid. So potassium can shift into cells by way of two pumps, the sodium potassium pump and the hydrogen potassium pump. There are certain medications which increase the activity of the sodium potassium pump on cell membranes. And these medications include insulin, catecholamines, and beta adrenergic agonists like albuterol. If we increase the activity of the sodium potassium pump, then this pump is jacked. And it transfers two potassium ions into the cell for every three sodium ions it takes out of the cell. But it does this now at warp speed. And because it is doing this at an accelerated rate, we will decrease our blood potassium levels. The last intracellular shift I want to talk about is the hydrogen potassium pump. And because this pump is called the hydrogen potassium pump, it plays a big role in acid-base balance. In an alkalosis, we have low blood hydrogen ion levels. In order to compensate, the body will try to take hydrogen ions out of the cell and shift them to the bloodstream. Because it uses the hydrogen potassium pump to do this, it must take potassium ions out of the blood and shift them into the cell. This will drop our blood potassium and cause hypokalemia. And this is one reason that hypokalemia and alkalosis go together. So the symptoms caused by hypokalemia are a result of the fact that potassium plays a huge role in action potentials and muscle function. In a normal cell, we have a normal resting membrane potential. And in muscle cells, it's around negative 70 millivolts. In order for an action potential to occur, a stimulus has to come along and cause the cell to depolarize to threshold. And once threshold has been met, an action potential occurs. And action potentials in muscle cells equal muscle contraction. Hypokalemia, however, hyperpolarizes the resting membrane potential. It moves it further from threshold. So this means that we now need a bigger stimulus to reach threshold and cause an action potential. So an ordinary stimulus will not cause an action potential and thus will not cause muscle contraction. And a lack of muscle contraction is shown as muscle weakness. If you want more information on how hypokalemia hyperpolarizes a cell, then comment below. But for now, we're moving on. So just remember, low potassium equals low resting membrane potential and muscle weakness. In the gastrointestinal system, smooth muscle weakness will cause decreased GI motility. And this will cause things like hypoactive bowel sounds, constipation, which leads to nausea and vomiting, and in severe cases, paralytic ileus. In the neuromuscular system, hypokalemia leads to muscle weakness, muscle cramps, fatigue, and paresthesias, which include things like numbness and tingling. In the respiratory system, muscle weakness of the intercostals and the diaphragm will lead to shallow respirations, which will cause decreased breath sounds. In severe cases, hypokalemia can cause respiratory arrest. In the cardiovascular system, weakness of the smooth muscles in the arteries leads to orthostatic hypotension. And this is because when you change positions from lying to sitting, your blood vessels need to constrict to get blood to your brain and pump against gravity. However, if your smooth muscle is weak in your arteries, then your arteries cannot constrict. And if your arteries can't constrict, then your blood pressure will drop when you change position. As regards the heart itself, 
hypokalemia increases the risk of cardiac dysrhythmias. Hypokalemia prolongs repolarization. During repolarization, the cell returns to resting membrane potential. If our membrane potential, however, is now lower through something like hypokalemia, then it takes a longer time for repolarization to occur. Anything that prolongs the repolarization of cardiac cells increases the risk of dysrhythmias. So for the diagnosis of hypokalemia, you'll want to draw a metabolic panel and see that the potassium level is less than 3.5. Additionally, you will also want to complete an EKG. Because hypokalemia prolongs repolarization, it changes the shape of the EKG. Here we have a normal EKG. The ST segment and the T wave represent repolarization of the ventricles. Anything that affects repolarization, so in this case hypokalemia, will alter the shape of these points. So in hypokalemia, you will see ST segment depression, an inverted or low T wave, and in some cases, a U wave. U waves represent repolarization of the Purkinje fibers and aren't always seen on normal EKGs. But once your T wave gets really tiny, that's when you'll see a U wave. And EKG changes are something that nursing professors and the NCLEX really love to test on. So make sure you commit these to memory. So for the treatment of hypokalemia, give oral or IV potassium or both depending on the serum potassium level. As regards IV administration of potassium, there are some important considerations. The first is that you should never, ever, ever, ever give potassium IV push IM or sub Q. You know who they give IV push potassium to? People on death row in order to stop their heart. So please don't ever do this to your patient. IV potassium is always given on an infusion pump, never gravity. And you should only give potassium at 10 milliequivalents per hour unless your patient is on telemetry. And even once your patient is on telemetry, you can only administer IV potassium at a max rate of 20 milliequivalents per hour. And this is because potassium administration can also cause cardiac dysrhythmias. IV potassium can also cause phlebitis, so always assess your IV site frequently. Additionally, Patients who are receiving IV potassium may complain of burning at or above the IV site, even if there is no infiltration. When this occurs, you can decrease the rate of your potassium infusion or Y site your potassium infusion to an infusion of IV fluids. If your patient takes diuretics, you can add a potassium sparing diuretic to their therapy. And then for some hospitals, if the patient is a diabetic and needs an insulin drip, you will not initiate the insulin drip until the potassium is above 3.3 milliequivalents per liter. And this is because insulin increases the shifting of potassium into cells and will cause or worsen hypokalemia. So if you are already hypokalemic, then you will drop their potassium levels even further once you start the insulin drip. And remember that low blood potassium can cause cardiac dysrhythmias. You should also encourage your patient to eat foods high in potassium. And these things include fruits like bananas, cantaloupe, strawberries, and tomatoes, vegetables like carrots, spinach, and then animal products, which include pork, beef, and fish. Hey guys, welcome back. Thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. If you get one thing out of this video, I want it to be how hypokalemia affects the cardiovascular system. If you got value out of this video, then click or tap the like button and don't forget to share it with a friend. Subscribe for new nursing videos posting every week. And if you want to see more fluid and electrolyte videos, then click or tap the screen right here. Otherwise, stay safe and I'll see you guys next video.